Hello lovelies. Today we're taking a look at Dark Habits. This is the 1983 film directed by Pablo Almodovar. This was also his first properly produced film and it was commissioned, correction, by a man named Hervé Azuel. And he was pretty much a a multimillionaire who was wanting to start off his own production company. So he commissioned this film. He wanted I guess you could say to turn his then at the time girlfriend <laughs> into a a star, uh, Cristina Pascual, who who plays the lead character in this film. So originally, Almodov Almodovar wanted to do a very Marlene Dietrich, very sultry woman who drives men and women wild type film. And unfortunately, just due to Miss ba Pascual's <laughs> A limited acting, acting ability, the the nuns wound up taking lead and the intended storyline was entirely changed. What we did wind up getting was a very fun film which I enjoyed very much. It's a dark comedy. It had me laughing at numerous points throughout the film. So this is a Spanish language dark comedy. It has dr dramatic elements in it as well. But the whole premise of this story is a cabaret singer flees to a convent for protection after her boyfriend commits suicide using heroin. She takes his diary with her. She's reading it throughout her visit there. And I imagine to a degree she's just worried that people are going to assume that she's the one who killed him or induced this this overdose or what have you. And she meets a very interesting group of, of nuns. They're not nearly as spunky as the women from Sister Act, but they're they're very entertaining in my opinion. And one of the things with this film is that director Almodovar, <laughs> tricky name to say, he often dealt with issues trying to defend the film as not being anti-Catholic, anti reason being the the nuns in this film are are very different. They're, they're actually very flawed and very human in more ways than maybe we're accustomed to viewing members of the the clergy. So just very quickly going through this group of nuns, which is no more than four to five women, give or take, and kind of as a an act of humility, they've been given just not very pleasant names. So for example, Sister Damned, who is, she's not necessarily OCD, but she cleans compulsively. She also cares for a a pet tiger that had been left at the the convent. Uh, so she considers this her own child as well. We have Sister Manure. I, I would describe as being very masochistic. She does things like breaking bottles and walking on broken glass barefoot. She also takes acid uh, in order to induce religious, what would you say, visions. We also have Sister Sewer Rat, who really doesn't care much for tending to the garden, but she spends her spare time writing lewd novels based off of the women that have come to the convent for help. We also have Sister Snake, who is probably the better ones out of the entire group. She's more of a seamstress. She occupies her time with creating fashionable dresses for the Virgin Mary, uh, for, for, the, for the Madonna to wear throughout the seasons. And we also have a a chaplain who helps her with her sewing. He's also a chain smoker who happens to be in love with the nun. And of course, the mother superior who, in my opinion, really takes the cake. She's, she's something else. She not only admires these fallen women, uh, she, she really doesn't stay too far behind herself. She has a, a heroin habit and a, a dealer who visits the convent quite regularly. She also has a penchant for not only just admiring fallen women, but she also enters relationships with some of the women that have come to the convent as well. And we have our lead character, Yolanda, who is the cabaret singer slash prostitute who comes to the convent 
for assistance. She herself also has a heroin habit, so obviously she hangs out with, with the mother superior to a degree, but she really doesn't get too chummy with her. It's more Sister Suarez, the, the writer that she spends the the majority of her time with. So it, it's a very interesting group of women and like I say, they're they're all imperfect, same as 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 you would say, same as people on the outside. It's it's unfair to hold a, a religious person or a religious figure to to higher standards and assume that they are not flawed. And obviously these are women who for lack of better better words, have to a degree moved away from the church, but they still continue to to work with the people and assist those that that are in need and which is actually just quite admirable. It's still within their their line of work and they're still following with the the vows that they had taken. So it's it's a very amusing film as I said, it had me cracking up at numerous points within the film, so obviously with the mother superior who who obviously has a preference for women even though she's supposed to be chaste and married to the to the church. She has an interest in Yolanda, Yolanda who obviously just kind of rejects these these advances, but the mother superior just will not stop. But Ultimately, Yolanda, throughout the course of the film, decides that she wants to get off the heroin. She goes through her detox period, and it's very cathartic. She realizes she really doesn't need this stuff in order to function as a person, whereas the mother superior, kind of just her true colors really show through, and we realize she is a person that just cannot leave, cannot leave the drugs, and she's just i guess just a person who is is prey to her own habits so just really quickly in regards to the film having been considered anti-catholic as well as just in regards to the women having moved away from the church yes i can see how this would be just kind of a very i guess confusing subject matter or or plot or storyline but <laughs> I, I love the the director's quote, which I'll paraphrase slightly, but in his opinion, true religion is to be able to love the sinner and indeed become like the sinner, for only then can one appreciate the nature of sin. And yeah, it's kind of like to know thyself is to love thyself, or Or, in other words, how can one really help the needy if you really don't understand the the problems themselves that, that other people potentially may or may not face? That's what I take from it. Read into it as you will, but I, I thought it was well stated in regards to, to the film and how it really isn't meant to be anti-anything. But I think it's a very well-written story, extremely entertaining. As stated before, there is a a nun who, I'm not sure if in this case masochistic would be the, the proper term, but she she really does go out of her way to, to punish herself for, for religious reasons, and mostly the reason being is because in her prior life she was a murderess. The mother superior lied in order to save her life. She became a nun and is entirely devoted to the church, excuse me, but she now feels this reason to, this need to pay constant penance, and her reasons are her own, of course, but that is how she utilizes religion or her faith or her belief system in order to, to help her through this, which is kind of misguided. She never really got past the the self-punishing aspect of it and not only just owned and embraced her flaw and moved past it and allowed her to become a better person and potentially better assist other people, she she stays stuck in this in this position of just, I don't want to say self-loathing, but just constant punishment. And there actually was a pretty pretty funny scene in the in the film. I know that all sounds very depressing and 
it, it does. The film has very dramatic elements as well. It's very well written in my opinion. But there's a humorous scene early in the film where when Yolanda first comes to the convent and she's having dinner with the nuns. I believe they're eating cake at the time and Sister Manure <laughs> is telling them about how she had this this vision about suckling the wounds of Jesus while she was making this this very beautiful decadent cake and one of the nuns tells her that's not a vision you were hallucinating <laughs> it, it it made me laugh but it, it's just these little touches just kind of these small bits of humor that that give relief there's also another scene later on in the film with sister manure and they are I want to say at a town square they're selling cakes and peppers and I forget what the third item was but there's this fire breather performer behind them and he's going through his act and Sister Manure takes a needle and drives it through her cheek which it's it's just funny to me kind of like she's challenging him or or saying so what I can do it too but I it just it has these funny little touches through it you really can't take the film too seriously and as, as I've stated previously it's not at least in my opinion let me rephrase that I don't take it as a knock on religion or people who have religious beliefs or live a, a certain lifestyle. I don't, I didn't take it that way at all. I was more interested in the character study and trying to understand these women and really get into the nitty-gritty of what exactly it is the director was trying to to portray and to tell us and obviously that's open to interpretation but this is what I took from it is just people who are not perfect and who isn't? Who is? I, we all have our flaws, whether or not we want to own up to them or we want to pretend to be better than we actually are. No one is perfect. And you can use your religion, you can use philosophy, your own personal belief system, the morals that you were raised with, whatever it is that you want to use to pull you through whatever hardship that you may have. But ultimately, you have to make the decision whether or not you are going to better yourself and rise above a certain situation. And that's really what I take from this. As I've said, the, the women are not perfect, but they're very human and they're very real. They're, they could be exaggerations, of course, but to a degree, they're, they're archetypes of actual people that do exist. And I'd rather just look at this from the point of view that you're supposed to learn and, and to grow. And this film is just reflective of life and different people that do exist. So just to get back on topic, I know I majorly digressed there. Thank you for your patience. But the 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 convent itself, it's it's not doing very well. There are not very many supporters. And it's pretty much just going under. The, the mother superior as well as other nuns have taken paintings and other items from the church to sell just to keep the place running. The church itself, in my opinion, the, bu the building itself, it's coming to shambles. It's falling apart. It's, it's not what it used to be. And I would say that's reflective of, of the women it's themselves, like what's going on internally with them. It's also what they're, they're living in and what they're surrounded by. So it, it's all just very interesting to me, just the symbologies. But we also have a subplot with somewhat of an heiress who had been sent to the convent by her father just in, as a means of trying to, I guess, control her and she got tired of living in the convent. She moved away to a convent in Africa, or she transferred rather, and the story is she was eaten by cannibals. <laughs> so the the Marquise, the the widow or the mother of this of this nun, she used to be a patroness of the convent. She has withdrawn her support and lo and behold one day a letter shows up from the African mission that her daughter had worked at and it gives word that her daughter had had a relationship with a man after her her death the the long lost child because she had obviously just moved on and had a family it's obviously she chose 
to to leave the order at some point in time entirely and she had a child this boy apparently had been raised by apes so in the letter itself it contains a a photo of this long lost grandchild as well as a locket or a photo of the the nun herself so the mother superior was supposed to give this letter to the marquise instead she decides to I guess you could say blackmail her or sell the letter to her. I believe the cost was 10,000 10, pesos or pounds, whatever whatever the currency in Spain is. And she refuses to, to, to buy into this. She just says, oh, I'm just going to write off to the mission myself and get the information myself. Meanwhile, the, the mother superior dangles this in front of her. Well, you can just find out now instead of waiting months to have a response. But in the backdrop of all of this, the the mother superior, the convent is celebrating her birthday party and neighboring nuns from a convent as well as the, uh, I guess the the mother general is what her, her title is. It's a I guess kind of like a, a higher uh, ranking type nun uh, comes to the party. They're not at all impressed with all of the decadence and all the decorations, which obviously are not in line with the, the belief system and how one is to humble themselves. Also, Yolanda is asked to perform at the birthday party. So of course, being a cabaret singer, it's at least in it's in poor taste as, as far as what should be presented for a convent. But um, ultimately, in, in the middle of all this unraveling, we find out that the Mother General has decided to close down the convent and everybody is going to either be reassigned or who knows what. So the Marquis the Marquise winds up getting a hold of the, the letter and all of this madness, so she still finds out what she was meant to know. And numerous other nuns just decide to, to make their own ways. So Sister Damned, who was the, uh, the person who kept the tiger, decides to leave the convent. She wants to go back to, to her motherland, and she decides to leave her her tiger, whose name is El Nino, the boy or the child, in the care of the the chaplain as well as Sister Snake. So in the midst of all of this, there's a lot going on in the film. It's, it's kind of hard for me to, to really do it justice and give you a proper review. But ultimately, Sister Snake and the chaplain, they, they confess their love to each other. They decide to leave the order and start a family. Obviously, the, they're they're mature and potentially not able to have children anymore and so the the gift of this tiger El Nino becomes their their surrogate son so it, it's very lovely in itself just kind of you know what what would you say transcendence they're they're leaving a life that they knew and they're going off and they're they're starting anew it's, it's a new beginning for them Yolanda leaves the convent doesn't even tell the mother superior that she's leaving so as the mother superior is trying to to find her and, and tell her this master plan that she's going to take a, a temporary trip to Thailand to just <laughs> run some product for a, a drug dealer in order to fund a the convent and keep things running she discovers that Yolanda is is gone and the only one really left behind to to console her is sister da uh, excuse me sister manure who is the the acid tripping nun but i i love this ending shot i think it's very beautiful where we just get this view of them through a window and it just pans back very slowly we have the shadows of some palm trees against the the wall and it kind of in my opinion the shadows seem to mimic the the embrace that the the two nuns are sharing it's I don't know I just thought it was very beautiful there's also a lot of uh, what would you say uh, ballads and uh, sentimental type music throughout the the film so that's pretty much the the language of the film it, it's it's very emotional or you know just 
very sentimental rooted or you know just the basis of humanity uh, of course for the the spanish genre the the songs are of course borracheras volederas which are just a lot of songs that deal with love and heartbreak and you know to some degree self-medicating to to deal with issues so there's a lot going on in this movie and like which is characteristic of Almodovar, excuse me, is they're just very complex stories, they're very in-depth, but excellent writing. This was written and directed by him, and this was his, I believe I stated earlier, his third film. It's also his third time collaborating with uh, Cristina Pascual. They worked previously on two other films, so the this, in my opinion, was really the film that was his big break. It was a production company that was a, a proper company, which was the Sauro production or Thesaurus production. But in my opinion, this is what really cemented him as a director. It also really kind of made his his reputation more more well known. The term which was used to refer to him was enfant terrible which is more just kind of a kindly way of saying like a, a genius but very unorthodox and avant-garde so obviously this was not very well received in film festivals it was just very misinterpreted once it came back to his native spain or madrid it really didn't fare much better but it, it really made him known to as one of those directors to really keep an eye on. I would encourage you guys to take a look at this one, especially if you love foreign film or Spanish language film. You will not be disappointed. This film is a riot. I I kind of more focused on the, the more serious points of the film, but it, it really is very funny and humorous as well. It has a good balance to it. And for those of you who are interested, we have previously reviewed In My Skin or um, El Piel Que Habito, which is also another Alm Almodovar film. So I will link that in the description box as well if anyone wants to take a look at that previous film review as well if you haven't seen it. And at some point in time I would like to go through his catalog of, of work, but that is pretty much all I have for you guys today and I will talk to you later.